Happy Friday, folks. It's the Tyrant here, and today we are finally reaching the incredible climax of our beloved Halo franchise. If you couldn't guess by the thumbnail image, today's main focus is on the one and only Halo 3. At this point in the series, it had been six years since the saga began, and three since the last time we saw the Master Chief while telling us he was going to finish the fight. I mean, think about that for a second. If you had to wait three whole years to find out who Negan killed on The Walking Dead, there would be rioting in the streets. Leading up to the release of Halo 3, we weren't exactly sure what to expect. I mean, sure, we already knew the graphics were going to look a lot better, but how is this going to be better than Halo 2? As the release date approached, Bungie began dropping documentaries on the production of the game. We learned that the Power Armored Brutes would be replacing the Elites, and there would be a new brute cache of weapons and vehicles including the Spiker, the Mauler, my favorite all-time weapon, the Gravity Hammer, as well as vehicles like the Prowler, and my favorite vehicle, the Brute Chopper. We learned of the new concept of heavy support weapons like the chain gun, the missile pod, the plasma cannon, and the kick-ass flamethrower. And to add even further to the arsenal, there were now four grenade types with the spike grenade and the firebomb making their official debuts. The humans finally get a flying vehicle to counter the banshee called the hornet, and even a mobile base we now know as the elephant. And of course, one of the certainly more interesting concepts we learned about was equipment. Similar to power-ups like active camouflage and overshield, equipment was to be a one-time use concept. The main difference, however, is that unlike standard power-ups, they needed to be used strategically. They could hurt you as much as benefit you if they were used in the wrong place at the wrong time. Take for instance the power drain. Yes, it could decimate enemy shielding and even EMP vehicles, but if deployed too soon, it could do the same to you. Same with the Regenerator. If you deployed it in the middle of a firefight, your opponent would stand to benefit from it just as much as you. This served to add a new and interesting strategic dynamic that would become unique only to Halo 3. But they weren't done yet. A magic thing called Theater Mode was introduced. We can now fast forward, rewind, or even stop time in any campaign or multiplayer game we played. I still couldn't quite wrap my mind around that one especially when they talked about a free room camera option, but time would tell, and it certainly wouldn't be the only thing that I couldn't wrap my mind around. Of course, I'm talking about Forge Mode. I mean, think about it. The ability to manipulate maps and create new ones was something that sounded so absolutely amazing that my narrow mind itself just couldn't understand how it would work. Would we have some sort of god cam where we would be looking down on the world? Or would it be some sort of direct interaction? Of course, we later learned that it was a simple, interactive, seemingly all-powerful monitor that would allow us to make all the manipulations we needed, but the idea was so new to me, at the time, it just seemed so impossible to even fathom. But the icing on the cake for me personally was the announcement of online co-op. Up until this point, most Halo fans deemed this to be impossible due to how the campaigns were coded, and that there was no way the same campaign could link up the same way on multiple consoles. Not only did Bungie prove these people wrong, they one-upped even that and implemented a four-player co-op system which featured four unique characters, allowing up to four people at once to play the campaign together on Xbox Live. But the best things we had to experience weren't even fully realized until we actually got to play it for the first time and were able to step into this living, breathing world with graphics polished to perfection and getting to see our two heroes, the Master Chief and the Arbiter, fighting side by side against a common enemy. It became instantly realized that Bungie had blended the best of both worlds of Halo and Halo 2 together perfectly. Once again, we had large, open maps with tons of options, just like in the first game with the classic bouncy physics to top it all off, but with the awesome new features and weapons that were added in Halo 2. This was what Halo felt like it was always meant to be. They had learned from the mistakes of their previous game, most notably with the concept of boss battles. Rather than implementing creatures with universe-breaking mechanics, the concept of the AI-controlled scarab was introduced. But even as threatening as these towering monstrosities were, they could still be defeated by conventional means. And man, who didn't receive a sudden rush of adrenaline and satisfaction? One of them blew up in a blinding flash of light. And the multiplayer, oh, it never felt so good. Halo 3 created its own iconic maps that soon became fan favorites. You had maps like Valhalla, which served as a spiritual successor to Blood Gulch. 
the epic map Guardian, and my personal favorite Halo 3 original map Construct, as well as so many others. But they made sure to include fan favorites from previous games, like Lockout and Midship from Halo 2, of course remade to better fit the Halo 3 tone, and of course my favorite all-time Halo map, Avalanche, which served as a reimagining of my previously favorite map, Sidewinder, from Halo Combat Evolved. This was true fan service to the max. But there was still so much more. Achievements were added both in campaign and multiplayer in order to allow players to set and obtain certain goals for themselves, a major feature that further added to Halo 3's replay value. And of course, there was one more thing. The thing that put my very self on the map as a Halo player. The ability to collect game manipulating skulls throughout the campaign and permanently retain them for future use. When used all together on Legendary, we called this Mythic Difficulty. This was a difficulty in which I created alongside my dedicated community that Bungie officially praised and even implemented as challenges in later titles. This even carried over to later games in the form of achievements and items you could unlock for your avatar. This was the power of the community and Bungie's dedication to its satisfaction. This was only further showcased in the form of the Bungie.net file share system, which allowed players to share their custom maps, game types, screenshots, and film clips to the entire community via Xbox Live or their very own website. And yet there was still more to come. As time went on and YouTube became more and more of a sensation, Bungie realized that the community had an increasingly desired hunger to share their experiences outside of Bungie.net as well. You see, at the time, Capture cards were not only expensive, but they also required very powerful PCs in order to be run successfully. So what did Bungie do? They implemented their own in-house rendering service where, for a small fee, they would render your videos for you. From there, folks could either choose to play them back directly on the website, or they could download them and upload them to other media outlets like YouTube. If there was one thing that made Halo 3 stand out the most, it was the visible relationship that Bungie had with the community and the way the community grew and flourished. There was once a time when you could sit at your computer looking at the Halo 3 forum on Bungie.net, refresh the page just a mere couple of minutes later, and all of the topics would be different. Why? Because that's how many people were surfing the forum at any given time. That's how big the community was and how active each and every member made themselves. That's how much they cared, and that's how much Bungie cared. Halo 3 served as a culmination of years and years of hard work and fan service, with each game being bigger and better than the last. This was truly Halo at its finest, not only in terms of the game itself, but also in the way the community worked together and communicated with each other alongside its favorite team of game developers. But, like all good things, they eventually come to an end. As Isaac Newton once said, what goes up must come down. Halo 3 would be the final game that only served to refine and add to the classic Halo experience we had all come to know and love the last game that served to only add and never subtract from a gaming experience that defined a generation. And that's what we'll be talking about in Halo The Rise and Fall Part 4, the pivot point. The point where things began taking a different turn in our beloved Halo franchise. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. What was your favorite feature or moment in Halo 3? What gave you that wow factor? Please let me know in the comments below, or you can let me know on Twitter and Facebook. I highly encourage you to share this video to get the word out. Let's get people talking about this, folks. And if you like this video and you want to see more, don't forget to click that subscribe button for more video game-related content every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right here on MythicTyrant.com. Have a great weekend, everyone. And as always, I'm the Tyrant, signing off.